You know, how many of you at times have thought and asked yourselves, what does God require of me? What does he want of me? What does he want me to do? What's, you know, it's, 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 you can ask that sometimes in our, in our lives, right? It's sort of like we want to do what's right. We want to do what God's will is. What is God's will? What does he want us to do with, in our life? I know I had that uh, a question brought before me. Uh, I was at the time, I was an attorney and I was uh, Western Regional Coordinator for an organization back east called Rutherford, Defending Religious Freedom, Parents' Rights. And I'd, been, I'd opened an office for him five years prior to that. I was in Sacramento, California. Everything was going really nice and smooth. And what happens in life when everything is really smooth and you're on cruise control and you're like, ah, okay, now we're good. I'll tell you what happens. Suddenly, a big cow gets in the middle of the road and you have to go left or right or have lots of hamburger meat. And that line really works well in Texas, I'll tell you. (laughs) So anyway, so that's what happened. The national office called me and says, Brad, we're closing down the regional offices, including yours in Sacramento. But don't worry, we have a promotion for you. I want you to head up our new public affairs office in Washington, D.C. You'll be the media point man for all of our cases, all of our litigation, all across the country. And so, of course, I didn't have to think about this or be able to pray about it because obviously God was closing one door and opening another door. And, of course, you don't have to pray about those things. Yeah. And so I, I said yes, and then I had insomnia. And I couldn't sleep. And I was double-minded. Next night, still couldn't sleep. Next night, still couldn't sleep. I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have to pray about this. Now, I'll be honest with you. Why did, I didn't want to pray. And the reason I didn't want to is simply this. Because when I pray over these kind of things, and there's two, a fork in the road, there's the easy road, then there's the other road, the hard road, that takes a lot of faith. You know which road I'm usually convicted to go on? It's not this one. It's not the easy Shangri-La thing. It's this one. And so, but I prayed, and sure enough, that's what I was convicted of. The question that quick, quickly came to my mind was, Brad, what desires have I put on your heart? Bam. A God was just really convicted me. I said, well, the desires on my heart is to make sure people get the help they needed here on the West Coast. And um, so uh, with boldness and courage, after being convicted, I said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will go where you told me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I will follow you faithfully on several conditions. Because <laughs> I was scared. I was very scared. I mean, start another, start a nonprofit? I mean, what a self-defeating thing to do, nonprofit. I mean... <laughs> So I didn't, have, I didn't have a big rich uncle from Texas with a you know, big oil well or anything to back it. But uh, so I gave God just a few little requirements. I have to have free office space and definitely donated in the city of Sacramento, free. Free computer system. Keep me on the radio stations. There were two at the time that interviewed me for free. Um, we have to be in the black in just three months. And I'm not going to charge anyone for any work I ever do. I thought that was very reasonable. And, um, and God came through on all of them, and um, it was incredible. The office space, by the way, I didn't tell people I was looking for free office space. I didn't have to. I told God. This is my back door, by the way. It's like, if you didn't do it, okay, I gave God your chance. Boom, I'm doing something else, something more secure, which is real important to me. But I get this call out of the blue just before we we're going to shut down the Rutherford office. And it says, yeah, I heard you needed office space. I've got free office space for you. I says, What? How'd you know I needed office space? I could have been like, praise the Lord, this is so good. No, I was like, what? How'd you know I need office space? And, um, and then the secretary comes and I said, excuse me. She went, put on hold. I said, excuse me, let me just put you on hold. Before. Okay. She goes, you don't know this, Brad, but I, I knew before we knew they were shutting down the Rutherford office, we knew our lease was expiring. I know you always like to save money for ministry. So I was going to surprise you. I had KYCC radio station be, uh, announce this about two months ago. Because <laughs> I was going to surprise you with free office space. Great. Yes, yes, I'd love to have free office space, you know. It's just how God works. And, um, and it's, it's so exciting because, you know, oftentimes we have concerns and fears, and we're like, we're not honest with God, you know, as, as if he doesn't already know what we're thinking and feeling. But, uh, but, if, but, what, but where do you go in the Bible, by the way, when you're, when you're discouraged and you want to be encouraged? Where do you, where's a, where do you go where you just want to be lifted up? What, what book in the Bible mostly? Psalms, right? So what do you, you go to Psalms, and you go there, you go, okay, let's say, oh, good. this is good. Ooh, ooh, not this one, not this one. Oh, oh, not this one, not this one. Okay. Ah, this one, this one, this one. Okay, we're all guilty. We're all Psalm flippers, okay? We're all Psalm flippers. And why are we Psalm flippers? Because God 
Uh, but David was a man after God's own heart. He allowed the Holy Spirit. He was transparent with God, honest with God, and the Holy Spirit blessed that and spoke through, through David, um, through that transparency. In the same way, God wants us to be honest. When we have hard times, we have fears and concerns. God wants us just to pour it out, put it all on the table, the way David did. And God blesses us for doing that. So, I was, uh, so God blessed it, and he take it, it took it, and the organization was established. And now we, we're, uh, as far as radio stations, um, the Dacus Report is heard on just under 100 stations nationwide. Uh, the commentary, the Legal Edge that we do, is heard on under just under, uh, it's like 299 stations nationwide, all across the country. We don't pay a penny for our media not a penny, and it just goes out there, and people need help, and they contact us, and we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteer affiliate attorneys, the largest network of its kind on the West Coast. We handle more case matters on the West Coast doing this work than any other organization in the country. It's just, it's so awesome, and it's just seeing how God just, boom, he takes it and runs with it, and just makes it happen, um, and it, all God wants is he wants us to be obedient. He wants us to be willing to take that rough road. And, um, and there's a great passage, I think, that really crystallizes some of the exhortation that God gives us. He broke it into three different parts, but let's start with Micah. Um, Micah chapter 6, verse 6. Or you know what? You don't have to turn there. Just trust me. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> well, you're really flipping fast. I see some of you going like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I was like, that's right. That's good. Let me just tell you about lawyers, just for the record, because we always get a bad rap, right? It's the 99% out there that give us 1% a bad reputation. Did you guys get that one? Okay, good. <laughs> so the 1% good, 20, okay. Yeah. So verse 6, uh, Micah, it's a, that's a little tiny book and um, towards the end of the Old Testament. Micah uh, chapter 6, uh, verses, um, verse 6. So I have some before Nahum, which is before Habakkuk, which is before uh, Zechariah. Anyway. Okay, uh, verse 6, it says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow before the high God? Okay, so that's a good question. I mean, God is God. What's, what should we do to, to, just to be able to address God, to bow before him? What, what, what shall we, we do, Okay. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Um, Verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then we have the answer in verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Real clear. I just love God. It's so clear. He could leave us speculating until eternity to try to figure out what is he, you know, what really he wants us to do, you know. Um, but he makes it really clear. Number one, to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So clear. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to break these, look at each of these three uh, for the time we have left. First is to do justly. Um, Pacific Justice Institute, that's what we're about, is justice, to do justly. And, uh, and we do that in a number of areas. One is in the, in the area of the workplace, helping believers who are being uh, increasingly attacked in the workplace because of their faith. Uh, in Macy's, there was a lady who had been there a number of years, always had Sunday off. She was always allowed to go to church. She had a new supervisor who says, no. You're not having Sunday off anymore. You're coming in on Sunday. I'm your new supervisor. Not a very nice person, was it? Wasn't needed. She'd already been accommodated for a long time. No problem. Great track record. And so she contacts us. We represent her. Needless to say, Macy's, who fought it, tooth and nail. So I don't like to go to Macy's anymore. So, But um, they, uh, they fought it and they lost. And our client uh, ended up very nicely settled, case very, very well. Um, the another case example is a, fr- a professor of, um, at uh, Fresno City College. He was teaching in charge of the health science department. He taught about the realities of different kinds of um, sexual conduct and lifestyles. 
And there's some lifestyles that are medically much more dangerous than other lifestyles and orientations. And he just spelled it out. Boom, 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 boom. Here's your statistical risk of this cancer and this disease and mortality rate. And here, here it all is. He got uh, written up and they were started an investigation. This, this whole, you know, to investigate him and, and to, to, to find out where he's really coming from. And they found him on YouTube leading a Wednesday night Bible study at his church. They declared that he was too biased to be able to be head of the health science department because of his Christian perspective. He wasn't teaching his Christian perspective in the classroom. He was teaching health science. And, but because of that, uh, he was demoted and uh, we represented him as well. Uh, we also had a case matter, actually it's ongoing, a dinosaur, um, well, excuse me, it's a professor at uh, Cal State Northridge and he's in the microscience department studies fossils and things like that. I've been doing this for a long time uh, as a profession. And he was uh, in Montana, discovered one of the largest triceratops uh, horns uh, discovered. I mean, it's intact. And inside he discovered soft tissue inside the triceratops horn. He did a, a peer-to-peer reviewed j- journal article on it, validated everything, what he said, what he discovered. Uh, one of the uh, his peers, professors, came in screaming at him, saying, I read your, your peer-to-view article supporting soft tissue. He says, and what you, you know, he says, I know your agenda. There's no place for, for people like you, your religious people in this university. And just screamed and yelled at him. Well, about a year later, that man who screamed and yelled at him was made the head of the department. And our client was terminated. Uh, so uh, we're representing him against Cal State Northridge. Why? Because there's an effort to purge Christians from academia. They want to do that. And it's not the new, latest thing because that's what they did in the former Soviet Union, in Castro's Cuba. Um, in these countries where they don't want Christians, they, they purge them from academia. You know, I was really encouraged when I went to uh, Hong Kong. I got to get a guest speak in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, okay. That's like important people get to do that stuff, you know. So I was like, yeah, I get to go to Hong Kong. Lost a few pounds, though. But anyway, um, it was really exciting. And I was there, and um, what I was, it was great to learn was the fact that in Hong Kong, only 5% of the people are Christians. And it's been 5% for a long time. Unlike China, mainland China, the rest of it was just exploding. For some reason, it's not. But I found out that 30 to 40% of all of the professors in academia are Christians. 30 to 40% of the politicians, the people in the, the Hong Kong, you know, legal, whatever, uh, community, whatever they call it, parliament, whatever they have, um, they're Christians. And I love that, you know, for us to be, have the, the salt and light and, 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 uh, and influence on the world. And so the enemy, Satan, wants to often boot Christians from uh, influence. We like to stand up to that. We also go to bat, uh, there was a, uh, a doctor, Dr. Jan Mensink uh, up in Bakersfield, who uh, has a, he's a medical practice, and he had the Department of Insurance and the Department of Justice for the state of California both investigating him, wanting copies of all his medical records, everything. Um, and what uh, triggered it was the fact he had Christian on his website, and they ordered it off his website. His website shut down, his radio show st- stopped. We went, to, we represented him, and um, the uh, both Department of Insurance, Department of Justice quickly retreated, and uh, and did everything but apologize, which was nice. I mean, getting government to to say they were wrong is really hard. So, we have closed our file on this matter. We are no longer being. You, know, you see, so you were wrong. We have closed our file on this matter. Okay, all right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, so, and then we also go to bat for people um, who are part of unions. Now, let's is, if God's given you a position of leadership or influence in your union, is that just to be taken lightly? No, it's a great opportunity to be a salt and light in your union. If you're in a, in a union you believe in, um, be active, be an influence, be a, a positive uh, uh, for the gospel and for people to come to Christ, okay? Wonderful opportunity. However, sometimes people are in a different situation. See, they're part of a union that supports issues, causes, maybe even candidates that clearly go against the word of God and the teaching of scripture. And, and they take your money, your union money, and they use it 
to fight God and fight what God's word teaches. That's a different situation completely. For people in this situation, I've got good news for you. And that is under Title VII, you're protected to have every penny of your union dues, all of it, not just the political part, but also your agency fee, fair share, all of it to no longer do your union, instead to be diverted to a charity that's in agreement with your faith. You're protected by law, no matter what union you're part of in the United States of America. I know, some, I know Mildred's saying, is that true, Elmer? Is that, yes, Elmer, I, Mildred, yes. It is true, every penny of your dues can go to, uh, to charity. And uh, but, so whatever your situation, do so for God's glory, okay? Whether, whatever, whatever scenario you may be in. Uh, then we also love to go to bat for, for schools. We see increasing intolerance towards Christians in schools. Students are reprimanded because they believe in what the Bible teaches um, or that because they're Christian faith. A, fifth, uh, a five-year-old boy down in Chula Vista was told that he couldn't sing a song, God of Mercy, for a talent show because the song was too religious. He could do God bless America, God, you know, God bless the USA, because that's not really that spiritual, they said. But God of mercy, oh, no, no, he can't do that. So we represented him, and he sang this. He played the song for the talent show, five-year-old. And it's so cute afterwards, because he, he says, People can't keep me from singing about Jesus. I have my whites, and I want to stand for justice. I mean, he's so cute. So I'm like a future lawyer. This is so good. <laughs> Makes my fangs grow an inch or two. Well, maybe, anyway. So encouraging. The fangs was a joke, just so you know. We, <laughs> lawyers don't have fangs. Anyway, so, uh, so that was, that was ex- encouraging. That was exciting. Um, yeah, another case of a teacher being forced to fly the rainbow flag in his classroom in the L.A. Unified School District, wear a red shirt for the Day of Tolerance. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I work with special needs kids. Uh, they don't need that. I'm going to focus on education. And he was bullied and harassed and bullied, pushed out of his position completely. We filed a lawsuit on his behalf, and the case settled very nicely uh, for that teacher. And we have to do that. Otherwise, it's going to continue happening. Unless you toe the line of this new, new agenda, uh, which goes against what Christians believe, then you're going to be uh, marginalized, isolated, and booted out. And we don't want that to happen. We want Christians to be elevated, to be a salt and light in the world around them. And despite the hostility. And by the way, if you're a teacher... Um, in, in a public school, you're one of my biggest heroes because we need more Christian teachers in public schools. It's very difficult to be a teacher. There's so, much, so many demands in different directions. Breakdown in the parent and the, the, the home and the family has been taken a lot, made it much more difficult for teachers to teach effectively. There's a lot of things going on. Um, so if you need assistance, please let me know uh, if you're a teacher. We also uh, deal with statutes and laws there's a new law passed in California that says boys that, are, um, that have gender identity dysphoria, that, uh, that feel like they're a different gender, like they're a girl on the inside, even though they're a boy, or a, boy on the out, um, or a girl on the outside, and they feel like they're a, gr- a boy on the inside. Okay, I'm sort of getting mixed up. But um, you get the point there. It's a mental condition, and, and kids who actually have this, you know, who aren't just you know, uh, saying they have it, but they mean they really have it, um, we need to have love and compassion for these kids. It's a mental condition. And, and uh, most kids, particularly in the elementary school level, uh, work through it and can work through it. So we need, to have, we need to treat them with love and compassion and counseling without question, okay? Because they didn't ask for it. But this law says that they can go into girls, like a boy could go into a girl's bathroom, a girl's locker room, a girl's shower. They have to treat him 100% like it's a female. And they can't make any distinction. Um, I have a problem with that, you know? I mean, a 13-year-old girl's in there in the locker room just undressed to get in the showers. In comes a 16-year-old boy, and they have to just pretend that he's a girl, even though biologically and his DNA are all in unanimous opinion that he's a boy, that he has a mental condition that he's a girl. And even then, statistically, even boys in that situation are still stimulated by girls, even though they have this condition. So it's very problematic. Well, a, a petition was distributed Parents signed it uh, to get this uh, new law repealed. It was passed um, by the legislature and the governor. Uh, we, uh, as it turns out, um, 120,000 of the signatures were invalidated for reasons such as, uh, well, the signatures changed since your last voter registration. So if you're elderly, um, the good chance your signature has changed and you've been disenfranchised. Uh, and we're, uh, we're fighting that. Also, if your a spouse printed your name and address before you signed it, both of those signatures were invalidated. 
yours and your, and your spouse's. So we are challenging that, and uh, we have had to bring in all 58 counties as defendants. It's a very uh, broad, uh, drawn-out litigation, and we are doing that, and let's uh, pray for us. Pray for us, because if we succeed, this will get on the ballot in 2016, and a lot of kids uh, will be uh, protected. Uh, just in Irvine, the vice principal who attends my church, he says, he says this boy goes, he can go right, goes right into the girls' locker rooms. Girls come out screaming. I said, there's nothing I can do. If he, that's what he says he is, then he's allowed to prance in there anytime he wants. And you just have to pretend it's, it's, a, it's a girl, even though, you know, a 16-year-old boy is definitely not a girl. I mean, okay, you know that. All right. So, um, so that's a real challenge. So pray for us on that. And then there's also, uh, for example, a charter school. I love charter schools, by the way. It's a great opportunity. Educational choice, I think, is generally good for, for the most part. And yet this charter school down in uh, Temecula area, uh, River Springs Charter School, great charter school, but the problem, they decide to take all books that have any kind of religious reference uh, out of them out of their library. At their library. The law says, no, you, public libraries, you can't discriminate based on viewpoint like this. So Corey Ten Boone's Hiding Place, out. What? It's a great book. So we... Uh, so that's something else that we're taking on right now as well. Then we love to go to, to have justice for churches. Satan hates churches, by the way. So we love churches because God's word loves churches. It talks about churches. Real clear. So we uh, go to bat for churches in, like in uh, uh, Guate, Guate, California, s- south of here, near, outside of San Diego. A little church was shut down. The only church in town was shut down after 20 years. Because 23, years, because 23 years prior, it had been temporarily rezoned as a country western bar. It's always been a church, but for short, the deal fell through, but they didn't do the zoning back again. So they were using this as a pretext to shut it down, and they padlocked the church, and they shut it down. We went into federal court, and the judge ordered the county of San Diego to take off the padlock. After four years, I'm pleased to announce, it's finally been over, uh, over and the church is finally protected which is great. It's the only church in that community. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's, it's a real encouraging, real encouraging to see that happen. Um, and then we uh, saw a church in San Leandro. They bought a building, a commercial building, because they outgrew their church. Well, you know what? The town of San Leandro said, we don't want those church people in that building. We're going to lose our property tax revenue. And then they came up with five other reasons. They said six reasons that they came up with to keep out those church people. Their lawyer helped them with them, I assure you. And we filed a lawsuit. The federal judge from San Francisco, from San Francisco, um, ruled against the church and said churches aren't protected. All these are all valid reasons to keep out those church people. We appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I, I know what you're thinking. Ninth Circuit, what good thing can come from the Ninth? I know what you're thinking. Well, just remember this. If in the Old Testament... God can speak to a donkey. Anyway, so he can speak to the Ninth Circuit. And that's what happened. Ninth Circuit reversed on all six counts. Gave us the strongest case law in U.S. history with regards to the rights of churches to build, grow, and expand and overcome land use and zoning restrictions. It has made things so much easier for our work now um, because it's it really been a major tide reversal, which I'm so excited about. Um, and, uh, and so I get encouraged. Oftentimes, is it true that the, the, the forces of darkness, if you will, is becoming more um, uh, evident and blatant? Oh, without question. We see it. It's just, it's, it's disgusting. It's just, it's all over the place. And, and the lies and to say calling evil good and good evil. But also God is being so gracious to continue the freedom and the protection for us as Christians to be a shining light. And that is so encouraging. So, so encouraging because the light is more powerful than darkness. And God's given us still that continued freedom to, to, to go, therefore, into all the world, and, and particularly here in the United States. And um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged. I'm not moving back to Texas. So for a number of reasons. But anyway, we won't go there. Um, wonderful people, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. But no, it's, God's doing a great work, and we're excited about it. Uh, what about... Um, it's, it's really funny. I've, I've talked to groups. They say, well, you know, how bad is it, Brad? Everything. I say, well, let me just tell you why I'm, I'm moving to Costa Rica. I just really feel 
of that in there. Oh, no. Okay, just to you. Just to you. Uh, yeah. Okay. But there's also justice in our, in our homes, not only in, in the workplace, in our schools, in our churches, but also in our homes. You say in our homes? Yeah, two, diff- two clear examples. One is uh, the rights to homeschool. This was, we had three appellate ju- judges say that homeschooling was illegal. Illegal in the state of California, unless you're a credentialed teacher, you cannot homeschool. Not one judge, an appellate court, binding on the entire state of California. We went into court and we asked him to rehear the case. I mean, I've never heard of judges in my practice of law for more than two decades ever say, oh, three appellate judges say, okay, yeah, we'll rehear it. We may be wrong. What? Three men, attorneys, in black robes, elevated on high, saying the r- 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 wrong word, you know? But they said, yeah, we'll rehear the case. They reheard the case. And after a lot of prayerful intercession, because frankly, we thought we lost even after the rehearing because they were really mean to us. <laughs> they were like, right, right, right. So how can you say this? And, and we thought, so we were preparing to appeal it to the state Supreme Court. We were already working on the appeal. <laughs> that, that's not good, okay? When, you, when you're that sure that you've lost it, you're already spending all your time working, on, preparing to appeal the state Supreme Court. And yet people prayed and they prayed and those three judges reversed themselves. And we now have the strongest. We went from being California being one of the weakest states in the country to homeschool in legally to being one of the to have one of the strongest states in the country to homeschool legally, and that's so encouraging. So uh, and uh, and homeschooling is booming, especially with Common Core. I won't have time, I don't have time really to get into that, but um, uh, there's a lot of concerns, you know, academic and otherwise. And uh, we're, we've seen uh, I know in North Carolina this li- just this last year. Um, Homeschooling has grown 14% in one year, um, uh, partly because of that. So, uh, and I think we'll see that continue, which, which is uh, some opportunities. Although it's hard to homeschool, just for the record, okay? When I was single, I said, every Christian should homeschool. This is God's way. It's a... And then God gave me Austin. <laughs> anyway, so uh, he's a, he's a, uh, he and Amy both have great kids, but... Um, it's, uh, it takes a lot of, I, I just really appreciate those of you who, who can do that because it's not easy. So, the, uh, Then uh, um, the home Bible studies have been under attack. Rancho Cucamonga, San Juan Capistrano, both places, uh, home Bible study, shut down. We stepped in, we represented in both cases, home Bible studies, brought back. And uh, in fact, it's so fantastic because in these situations, especially San Juan Capistrano, we have like a model policy a model because of it, and everyone heard about the litigation, so it just sends waves across the country, and so we use that in Venice, Florida. I've ever been to Venice, Florida? No. Do I know where it is? I have no idea where it is. I don't have to. The city resolved it before we even had to, had to step into court. You know, we sent it, boom, and they adopted the model policy, and so now church uh, homes, home Bible studies are protected, and that's real important because saints, we may find a day when that may be our only opportunity to, to meet, like in China. That's what they do. So, okay, so God wants us to do justice. That's important. And also, only a little, like a final point about justice. Um, part of justice is for us as Christians also to be, be careful to be too quick to judge or to say this is injustice. We need to get all the facts, okay? We've learned that, I think, in our nation. It's get all the information, get all the facts, and, 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 um, because that's true justice, is making sure that you've, you've heard all information. Um, as a parent, I've learned that so well. Amy will come in and say, uh, Austin, da 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 And then I've learned as a parent, Austin, what's your side of the story? Very different perspective. <laughs> Amy, she did da 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 And all I did, I just barely touched her. I just went like this. <laughs> just barely. Okay. Or whatever, you know. It's funny watching other Well, it's, afterwards it's funny. So, but um, reality is, is we need to be just. We need to get all our information and, and, um, and doing so. So justice. But what about number two? Love, kindness, and mercy. Well, as an attorney, I'm really not into that. So let's move on to number three. No, I'm just, just teasing. Okay, just teasing. Okay. Uh, God wants us to love kindness and mercy. Um. Number one, when it's inconvenient, when it's inconvenient, uh, like for example, nursing homes, not exactly often necessarily the pleasant places, most pleasant to be sometimes is, you know, it can be 
sort of sad watching people in the very last part of their, ch- you know, the chapter of their life. And so I've just haven't been someone who's gone to nursing homes a lot, and yet they're wonderful places with wonderful people to to uh, to love and to spend time with when you get you know to to invest in their lives, and um and it can be a real blessing. The uh, let me give you an example. The um, uh, the uh, I, I have a fr- person on our board of directors uh, who's also a friend of mine. He says, Brad, my mom, she has Parkinson's, and um and so she's in this uh, and she doesn't know the Lord. And, uh, and a lot of people have that condition. She says, it doesn't work. So I went into, uh, she says, can you go to the, the home she's in in Sacramento? You live in Sacramento. I said, well, um, we'll see. Um, you know, where does she live? And I thought it's going to be probably on the other side of town. I can say, I'm sorry, she's too far away. I was all ready for my excuse. And he says, yeah, it's in Madison and Mariposa. Great. Just a few blocks from my house. <laughs> right on my way to work. I drive right past it on my way home. I mean, it's just right there um sure i'd be happy to brother yes uh yeah i'd be happy to to see her so i did and um and she she's sort of a tough person you know it wasn't real her background you know um and i got to got to know her read the scriptures and brought my girl in we'd we'd play uh, christian songs and she'd sing to her and and by the way, you want to minister, encourage people in nursing homes, bring in the little kids and um, things like that. They just just glow. Well, I did that, and that little and that woman, one day, she prayed to receive Jesus. And my friend, you know, visiting, he visited her as his stepmom. He says, Brad, I visited my, my stepmom. She's changed. She's, she's so different. I said, yeah, she, she's a Christian now. She, goes, she she prayed to receive Jesus, and he was like so excited, um, and uh, and so well, it's wonderful opportunities exist for us to to reach out and to minister, and you don't have to have your doctorate in divinity to do that, to love and to share Jesus. Don't it's really it's really not that hard to do. Um, there's another example of a, a lady on Babel Island. She was an actress, former actress, and she could cuss the wallpaper off a wall. I mean. And everyone hated her, and she hated everyone, okay? I mean, I mean, everyone knew who she was, you know? And well, one day I was walking there on the boardwalk with my, which is sometimes fun to do, you know? And, um, and, and, uh, and, and it, was, it was great, and we were, and, and my little girl was three, I think, at the time, and uh, Amy, and we walked past, and my little girl was just so wonderful. She just goes, hi. And that lady goes, Hi. And it opened up a dialogue. We stopped. She started talking to my little girl and dialogue. And, and uh, we befriended her. And she ended up going into a nursing home not too much later than that and, and began to wear, wear out. And, and just, just that process, she became more like a child and, uh, in her demeanor. And she finally prayed to receive Jesus. And, uh, and you could see it. It's just it's so exciting. Wonderful, wonderful ministry opportunities. Uh, is it inconvenient? Yes. Uh, is it a blessing? Oh, yes. Um, another example is uh, reaching out to people who are uh, in prisons. There's a prison over in Chino for 18 to 24-year-old men, uh, men young men. And I was uh, given the opportunity to guest preach there. I said, sure, I'd love to preach. I'll preach anywhere. I'd love to preach there. So I was preaching there, and they all, they all had the same um, church uniform on. So, no. <laughs> anyway. No, anyway. So, I know, and so I'm in there preaching the word, and and, all, and then there's the security guard over here. And he's like standing right here the whole time. And he sees some people over there talking in the back. And he says, hey, you in the back. Stop the blankety blank up. And you start blanketing and listen to this guy. He's got something to say. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I mean it, totally different. Never heard that before in a church. Um, but these guys, they need, they need Jesus. They need encouragement. They need love. God doesn't give up on anyone. Why should we give up on them? You know? And so it's easy to do that, isn't it? Especially when you sort of get jaded and, ah, just throw the book and forget these people. And I'm just so glad that God doesn't do that. And neither should we. Um, God doesn't give up. And, uh, another example of, um, 
of uh, being in, in, where, it's, where it's inconvenient uh, is dealing with orphans. We want to protect those who are, who are orphans and reach out to them. In today's society, it means being a foster parent. And uh, we had a matter down in Temecula where uh, this representative for the Riverside uh, CPS came in and uh, for the foster program. And they said, uh, social worker says, um, so of course, you know, if you're going to be a foster parent, you have to, uh, you know, not discriminate any, or about sexual orientation. You have to embrace that if that's what they're in and just encourage it and just never say anything in any way uh, or take them anywhere like, you know, church or anywhere that may be offensive to them. Really? And we contested that, and they have moved that person to another uh, part of the division, I guess, uh, because uh, we as Christians have a wonderful opportunity to give hope and love to these kids that need hope and love, and a lot of them don't have it, you know. And uh, we also, by the way, give emergency counsel, just so you know, to parents who have social workers threatening to take their kids um, because they need help big time, because a lot of kids are taken that shouldn't be taken. Some need to be taken to be protected, but other kids should not be taken, and so contact us immediately. Uh, my phone, 24-7. People have access to it, seven days a week. Um, if there's in crisis and there's a social worker threatening to take their kids or wanting to investigate, so contact us if that happens. Um, it does happen quite a bit. Over half the kids, by the way, are returned in three days, which tells you a lot of kids are taken that shouldn't be taken and are traumatized, unfortunately. Um, we also need more Christian social workers, just for the record, too. Really need a lot of, I love to see Christians in social worker and teaching. Those are my two favorite occupations to invade with the, with the kingdom. So um, if you're thinking about either of those, just really pray about it because that could be a great ministry opportunity. We also, God wants us to get involved when it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable. Um, this uh, transgender activist, one of the leaders in the state of California, demonstrated in front of our, our, our office in Orange County with uh, like 10 other people. It wasn't a very successful demonstration in my opinion, but that's okay. Um, well, less than two weeks later, we're on the same TV show and down out of a San Diego station and he's on this panel and you know, there's three of us and he's right there next to me. And I'm like, this is great, great opportunity. So in the intermission, the break time, I said, hey, I said, you know, this may seem, sound strange to you, but um, it could really benefit me to understand you, understand what you've been through, what you've gone through. It could really help me. Uh, I'd really like to get to know you. Is it is it possible for us to visit afterwards? And he says, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So we talked for 10 minutes, half hour, an hour, two hours, three hours, about three and a half hours visiting. My wife is like, where's where's Brad? The dinner's getting cold. You know, what's going on? No, I'm visiting with this transgender person, you know. And it was great. And, um, uh, and I got, you know, he cried three times while we were talking, at least three times while we were talking. And I just, the goal, I mean, he was raised Baptist. He knows the gospel. He knows what I believe, because I believe in what the word teaches about that. But, uh, but he saw love and respect, and God has taught me, give love and respect for these people, because I love them, um, and, and to take them where they are, um, and to, to demonstrate the love of Christ with them, and getting to know them. It's, is it uncomfortable? Yeah. I mean, I, I really don't relate to him like I do some other people in life, you know, that I have, I have more in common with. But it's not about just being comfortable. It's about reaching out so that all people can come to Jesus and, uh, and be um, set free. And, uh, and so that was a, it was a really interesting situation. Also, God wants us to show love and kindness and mercy with when uh, people are hostile to us. And there's hostility. 2 Timothy uh, 3.12 makes it very clear. It says, For indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. So when you're living for Jesus, you're going to have some hostility against you. Don't act so as though some strange thing's happening, okay? This is par for the course, right? And uh, in fact, I was hearing on my way up here a, um, a, a pastor from the Calvary Chapel in Tustin. He was talking about that in the end times, like, you know, don't act so there's some strange things happening when we're persecuted because this is, this is what has always been the, the par for the course for Christians. Uh, Christianity is convicting. The truth and the light in us is convicting uh, to people. And they, if they don't repent, have a repentant heart, they can be very, very hostile to us. Uh, an example of that uh, was in Yuba City. Now, 
in Bakersfield, I was speaking at a conference about 20 years ago, and uh, this activist came on stage, and, um, and my kinfolk in Bakersfield, I have a lot of kinfolk there, they booted him off this, the stage, and, and I, said, that's, I said, that's why we're here today, because we're about freedom. They're not for freedom. They're about intolerance. We're about freedom to believe. Rah! <coughs> and I thought, oh, I did such a great job. I, God really loved that, you know, the way I just smashed these people into the ground, you know, with my, my tongue, you know. No. Anyway, God's been, been working on me. And then um, fast forward about 15 years later, there I'm in uh, Yuba City speaking at a Christian business conference, businessmen's conference at this big church in Yuba City. Um, big, big at least for Yuba City, okay. And so there we were, two-thirds of the way done with it. And this activist, homosexual activist, comes screaming and yelling at me, comes right up to the front. And, uh, and I said, you have no... No, I didn't say that. Because <laughs> God had been preparing me for three months prior to that with the question, what would you say or do if you were confronted with them? What would you say or do? That's how the Holy Spirit works, by the way. He just sort of... Have you heard that happen, Pastor? I mean, people you, where you just... And then later on you find out, well, this was the preparation that God had been preparing me for. Screaming and yelling at me, and I said... Excuse me, sir. First, I just want to recognize you right now. I said, it takes a lot of guts and courage to come up here in the middle of my speech in front of all these people to, to come up here and interrupt me. So I first want to recognize you for your courage. I said, that's, that's very admirable to have that kind of courage. I said, also, I want to recognize your sincerity. I can tell just by you talking that you have deep, sincere convictions. I said, and it's good to have, have sincerity uh, as, 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 as a part of your beliefs and be sincere about it. I said, but here's my problem. You see, these people here, they brought me here to speak. I'm only two-thirds of the way done with my speech. I said, and I said, so if you could be so gracious as to let me finish my speech, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to head right there in the back, and I'm going to sit down and listen to everything you have to say. I said, will that, will that work with you? He goes, uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't used to that. He's used to, this is what we're about, rah, 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 you know. He didn't get the rah, rah, rah. He got this guy connecting with him. And so he goes in the back. As soon as I'm done, I meet with him in the prayer room. That's where they put him in the prayer room. It's great. They go, we got him in the prayer room, Brad. You know, <laughs> we got two guys in the front door. We hear any yelling or anything, we're, we're in. We're going to rescue you. Yep, five minutes, okay? We'll, I mean, I said, the, the guy's not that big. And, I mean, I think I'm okay, you know. He's not going to you know, trample me, but, um, but we connected, and I talked to him, and it was really neat, you know, is he changing? Not yet, but it's all about loving, and respecting, and connecting, at the same time, not forfeiting the truth that we receive, for we are not to be pleasers of men, but pleasers of God, and if we sacrifice the truth, and we say, oh, what, this is fine, no, you say, say, no, you know, I believe what the Bible says about this, and the Bible um, says this is not, not fine. But you know what? There's things in my life that aren't fine and God's working on me. And what I really love about the Lord is he takes me right where I am and he'll take you right as you, where you are. I said, that's the kind of God that I know. Um, and he, he does the transforming. He does the work. And to give them that kind of a hope is encouraging. I had a uh, pneumonia about a year ago. How'd I get a pneumonia? That's just for old people, right? That's what I thought. I get my shoulder cuff surgery. Doctors come in, um, they operate, but they didn't do the tube right down the throat for my shoulder, and uh, bacteria got my lungs. 48 hours later, I'm in the hospital with full pneumonia, severe pneumonia, three different quadrants, 2.8 uh, lactic acid level. If you know anything about that, that means it's not good. And, I was, and uh, so there I am, uh, and here I have one of the, the attendants who just likes to come in, spend a lot of time in my room. He's, here's my boyfriend's new picture, our, our, new, our, our, our dog. 20 years ago, I would have pushed the red button, filed a complaint, had him fired. I mean, because you're so handsome and all this stuff. Instead, I said, wow, that's a really nice dog, you know. I really, that's a nice dog. Great to have a dog like that. I was finding my point of connection, you know. And I connected with him. He kept coming into my room, kept wanting to, he did all his work on the computer in my room, you know, the, there and then. The uh, hospital, and at the very end, I said I got to share with him about my accident and what got it done, and um, and about how God takes us right where we are, and I could just see the Holy Spirit moving. And I don't I don't know what happened after that, but I got to. He said, "Oh, you must be a, a pastor." I said, "Oh no, I'm far from that. I'm a lawyer." And uh, <laughs> it was great. 
that's the time it paid to be a lawyer. Cause, cause he, you know, but, um, but it's exciting, and God wants us t- to, uh, to be willing when it's hostile to, to reach out. Number three, uh, to walk humbly with your God. God wants us t- to always walk. What, what does it mean to walk humbly with our God? First, it means to be unconditional. To so God, it's, it's up to you, okay? I'm, I'm unconditional. It also means uh, giving glory where glory's due. I used to think being being humble is like like in high school, like being like really awesome, like you know I'm really you know I'm I'm the I'm the guy I'm really you know super awesome, but if someone asks says oh Brad you're so awesome I'd say say you know oh well no 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 I'm no nah, I'm not awesome even though I know I really am no 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 um, that didn't happen to me by the way just for the record okay <laughs> I never made the football team so hence I was never awesome, um, but I used to think that what it was sort of this false humility kind of thing that's not humility, humility is recognizing that without God, we're nothing. With God, we're everything. With God, we are a child of the living God to continue for eternity, impacting for eternity. That's awesome. But without God, we're nothing. We're like the Kansas song, Dust in the Wind. That's where we're at. Um, But with God, we're everything. It's not who we are. It's never who we are. It's whose we are. We're a child of the living God. I know when I was, um, I had a major auto accident when I was 16. And, um, and I was in Texas driving to school, my little Opal GT. And a motorcycle was passing cars, hit me head on in my lane. Motorcycle went smashing right through my windshield and smashed right through my, on my, my skull. And this was just all smashed in, this whole side of my face. This has all been reconstructed. Pretty good, you know, I mean, a little, no. Um, fortunately, I went like this, so they had the right side still intact to look at. Otherwise, I might be looking different, you know. But they also had to cut a large hole out of the skull for the brain to swell. It was that major of a brain injury. Big time. About a third of my brain, the left frontal lobe, was, uh, was hemorrhaged, swe- literally physically swelling out. Billions of neurons disconnecting. I, initially, I could not remember my younger brother's name. Um, I was in intensive care, and my parents were told, if he lives, he still could be a vegetable, and you may still have to pull the cord, end quote. Uh, as far as the world was concerned, my future was in the trash. Only be pity for what could have been. And yet, Californians, our God is a great recycler. And by his providence and grace, he, he loves to take that which the world has thrown away and do something new. And that's what he did with me. I had tremendous healing. And um, I uh, uh, got my undergraduate degree using that left side of the brain, which deals with logic, reasoning, analytical skills, and speech communications. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in finance at Texas A&M. Um, that's where I <laughs> learned my manners. And um, no, just teasing. Um, graduated with a 3.85 in my major, 3.85 finance. Using they called me, said, "Brad, you're such a brand." I said, "Really, which half are you talking about?" You know. Um, and then uh, I worked a couple of years, put myself through law school on my own. Graduate from the t- one of the top 20 law schools in the country, University of Texas, top half of my class, which was my, was my goal. Um, and the d- neurologists, doctors, their conclusion after all this was that, well, you must have been a genius prior to your accident. That's the only explanation we have. Well, it just so happened when I was a, a, a kid in elementary school, I was in California, <coughs> and I never made the mentally gifted minds or gate program, ever. Never scored a 140 above my IQ, ever. Three and a half years after my head injury, I took an IQ test. You know what my score was? 140. So God healed. Now, is it the same brain? No, it's a little different. People say, Brad, you're always, I always thought you were a little weird. Now I understand. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, more creative. Uh, became, I'm a spontaneous songwriter now. Um, before I couldn't write a song if I had to. On the other flip side, um, I get like once a month, or once every other month, these endorphin rushes, and I have to, lower my head down, put my head to the floor, put my rear in the air. Very humbling posture, especially when you're speaking. Um, yeah, it's happened before. It's, um, but, but God's, you know, God, that's my, my Passover. Every time it happens, I have a remembrance of what he brought me through. And it humbles me. I have this feeling of humility that just comes, pours over me. And, uh, and the neat thing is, is that it's not about us, it's what God wants to do through us. That's what's so awesome. You know, we're talking about ministry. I heard they had 26 people meet to talk about ministry, getting involved. I mean, the first step, as far as I'm concerned, realizing it's not about us. It's about, it's not who we are. It's whose we are. 
and being open and humble enough to let God work through us where we are and, uh, and make a difference. Uh, I never, I'll never forget, um, and by the way, we have a book called Reclaim Your School, all about how to legally evangelize public schools. Well, t- my wife and I were putting the book together, and we wanted an example of a revival rally at a high school. So we had this revival rally at a high school, Mesa Verde High School, Orange, uh, Cal- Orangevale, California. And this guy comes up from Southern California, Warren Willis. He sees it, and afterwards, this older, older gentleman, he says, Brad, I want to meet with you to talk to you about how I can, we can motivate college students to evangelize kids on high school campuses to be effective for, I'm listening to this guy going, this is a waste of my time. <laughs> this guy is the most unmotivational, not, I've, I'm seriously, the most monotone, non-motivational I've ever seen. It's almost like a, 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 a spoof, you know? And yeah, so I sit down and talk with my wife and I, and this person who I thought is the most unqualified and un- incompetent to do that starts a ministry at Biola, has reached out to over, have revival rallies on over 60 high school campuses, over 500 kids have come forward to receive Jesus. He is going wildfire in the state of California. And it's so incredible because it's not about Warren. It's about who is in Warren for the kingdom. By the way, I found out earlier with Campus Crusade this guy started over 100 churches in Mongolia. Okay, so don't limit God. Be open to what God wants to do through you. Because it's not about that. It's not about whose we are. It's, it's, it's not about who we are. It's whose we are. And, um, and that's the bottom line, what we need to do as Christians. Uh, and, the, you know, there's so much humility also when I was going through the hardest of times. People say I was terribly went through that accident. But you know what? When it was the hardest of times, when I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you know, I said, God, why don't you just take me home? I'm obviously no good for you down, there, down here. Why don't you just take me home? I couldn't even bathe myself. And the only thing I could do was I, could cling, I clung to God like a little boy clings to his dad. And it's at those times when the Holy Spirit can really speak to us. So when you're going through hard times, we don't like them, but, but cling to your dad, your Abba, your father, and let him minister to you and demonstrate his, his, his love and his, his sovereignty and his power and his grace and, uh, and really uh, use it as an opportunity to grow in your faith in the Lord. Um, now, some of you may hear this message, other than the fact that you're saying you're hungry, but also, you also may be thinking, um, don't worry, I'm hungry too. It's my metabolism. But uh, some of you may say, well, that was a nice message, but I don't think God could ever use me, not because I'm, I don't want to be used, but um, I've got sin in my past. And you really don't have a personal relationship with the Lord because of that. Sin is a barrier. And so you may, maybe something had happened 50 years ago, maybe something yesterday, but you've got sin in your past. You've got this dark closet. And by the way, everyone has one, just for the record, okay? Um, but you say, how can God forgive me for this sin? How can you have a really, truly personal relationship with me? Because this sin is so disgraceful, I can't even forgive myself. You know what really saying to the Lord? It's the same as walking up to Jesus Christ on the cross and saying, nice try, Jesus. But you see, for me, that's just not good enough. And his response from the cross to that lie, I believe, was when he said, it is finished. And all we have to do is in humility to believe it, and receive his payment for our sins on the cross. And he will separate that sin as far as the east is from the west. And he's ready to do it right now. And all we need to do in humility is to be able to receive it. As I'm speaking this, there could very well be someone here who feels the Holy Spirit grabbing at their heart saying, now's the time, release that sin and be forgiven. And, uh, and let's, uh, let's pray right now and let's let God do what he wants to do. Uh, Lord God, we thank you, we praise you, Father, uh, for the work of your kingdom here on earth. Thank you that you're on the throne, Lord God, that we don't have to worry and be anxious. We just, you just want us to be obedient and faithful and to trust in you and what you're going to do in our lives. Father, we pray also, Father, for anyone here, Lord, who, who felt convicted, Lord God, that they have been, maybe they've played religion, maybe they've gone to church and gone to, con, con, uh, to confirmation and church camp and whatever, but they've never entered into a personal, real intimate relationship with you because they can never, never let go of their sin. 
Uh, Father, we pray right now for your Holy Spirit to convict them. And if you're one of those people with every head bowed, just simply say this prayer with me right where you are. Say, Lord God, I'm a sinner. You know my past. You know what I've done. And right now, I, I, in faith, receive your gift of forgiveness, your payment for my sins on the cross. I right now receive that completely. And I, I thank you for right now forgiving me of that sin and separating that sin as far as the east is from the west. Uh, and Lord, I want to live for you. Um, I want you to take the reins of my life and you make me the person you want me to be because I can't do it on my own. And, uh, and you make me the person, Lord, you want me to be. And I, I surrender to you right now. And thank you for being my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, let me tell you something. Satan is really ticked off big time because he just lost his hand of dominion on your life. And he's really upset with that. He just lost someone. You know, his consolation prize is that you're going to be quiet, keep it to yourself, minimize it, hopefully forget it because he doesn't want you on the battlefield. He wants you on the sideline. So to make sure we give him a, a double black eye this morning, um, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but if you prayed that prayer, I simply want you in humility just to raise your hand so we can clap and welcome you to God's family. You want to pray that prayer this morning? Praise God. Anyone else? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? Praise God. We have an awesome God. We have an awesome God. Go ahead. Amen. Wasn't that great? Wow, a lot of information there. Praise the Lord. Please make sure you fill out those forms and get connected with the Pacific Justice Institute. Uh, those that raise their hands, please come forward afterwards, and we'd like to give you a packet, get you started on your relationship with Jesus Christ in the right way. So.